And so today's, uh, today's session is really the introduction and, and basics. Um, I'm going to go ahead and shut my video off so you guys can see the whole screen. And hopefully you can still hear me. But um, we, we broke this into three parts, uh, this whole workshop, three one hour workshop, uh, workshops and sessions. The first one today is introduction and basics. So instead of covering individual trees, we're not going to do that as much today. We're really going to hit the characteristics uh, that you need to be able to identify um, trees. What do you look for in the winter? Kind of what's the approach? How do you go about doing it? And so the idea is that we're laying that framework at the beginning so that any tree that you come across, you have the skills and the knowledge to kind of go out and identify that tree. After that today, Wednesdays and Friday sessions are really going to focus in on specific trees. We're going to look at about 20 different tree species both of those days in detail about how to identify them. All these characteristics we talk about today, we're going to apply those to trees in the next two sessions. Um, hopefully you all have seen the handouts. So we do have um, the handouts for today and for Wednesdays uh, presentations already up uh, on the web for download on this link here. And I think Kevin's going to put this link in our in the chat box so you can get to it directly. Uh, the one for Friday is not up yet because I'm not quite finished with it. Um, I'm going out tomorrow and I got to get a few more pictures of trees uh, to finish out Fridays. But hopefully by uh, Wednesday's presentation, we'll have Friday's handouts ready as well. Alrighty, so jumping into this today, um, again, the basics. We're going to start with some resources. What are some resources that you can use to help you identify trees in the winter? Um, and then the heart of today is going to be this terminology, really looking at what are the parts of the tree that we use for winter identification. And we're going to look at things that, like twigs and buds, bark, the form of the tree, unique features, and then the habitat or where the tree goes, uh, grows. And so that's kind of all those together are what we look at. Since we don't have leaves, we often don't have fruit. You have to kind of approach winter identification a little differently than you do identification during the growing season. And then we'll end with kind of the process or the steps or kind of how I approach winter identification, what I look for when I come up to a tree and trying to identify it. And that's going to include using keys and how to use keys to help us identify things that are truly unknown. And we have to kind of work through these questions and those keys will use the characteristics that we talk about um, today. So that's kind of the process. That's what we're gonna look at um, today. Again, I hope to finish with plenty of time for questions. Uh, if we do run long or there's a lot of questions, I'll end it at three, but I'm, I'm happy staying on later if we have a lot of questions and people want to stay and we can answer some then as well. Um, I guess I should have introduced myself. I think I forgot to do that at the start. I am Chris Evans. I'm an extension forester here with the University of Illinois. Uh, I've been doing tree work really since college. Um, uh, so 20 some years now. Um, with my master's work in forestry, we really focused a lot on tree identification and surveys and then have just kind of been building it up since then. I really enjoy plant identification and so I wanted to build this workshop. Um, it's just a way to kind of get more of this uh, information out, get these skills out to people. So I'm, I'm hoping that it's useful. So jumping in here to identification resources, there's a bunch of books out there on tree ID. A lot of those focus heavily on the growing season characteristics. So the things that you're going to see um, in the summer, right? And so there are a few that do cover winter ID fairly well. And this is one that I really like. This little, it's a small little pocket book called the Winter Tree Finder. Um, this is one that is really good for people that are just learning. Um, it, it, it's basically a key um, and you go through. It's very simple to use. Um, I like it. I recommend it. And when I teach in-person uh, winter tree ID courses, which I love to do, um, this is the book that I have a bunch of copies of this. And this is the one that we use actually out in the field to learn how to use keys and learn how to identify. It's very inexpensive. Um, and so if you're starting out and you're basic and you're just trying to learn winter tree ID, I would highly recommend um, this inexpensive, really 
good pocketbook, basically, um, just to keep with you. It's great to take out in the field. Really good resource. Another one, and this is kind of a historical or a classic resource out there, and this is the one that I learned on in my dendrology class back in the 90s, uh, Woody Plants in Winter. I think this book was written in the 50s or the 60s. Um, and this uh, focuses on the Northeast, but it covers almost all the species that we have here um, in Illinois. But it is, um, again, one of those classic resources, has a lot of information in this book. Uh, so it's one to definitely um, keep on your shelf as a resource if you're looking to delve deeper into kind of how to identify um, trees in winter. I'll add uh, our own book here, the Extensions Publication, Forest Trees of Illinois. So this is one that is a, a good book. It covers all the, the trees here in our state. It has um, a, a keys built into it for normal, you know, growing season identification, as well as keys for trees in the winter that focuses on the characteristics we're gonna talk about today. It has a two page spread for each um, tree species that's native here in Illinois. Just a good resource, um, fairly inexpensive, and I see the, see the link there, you can go. Um, it's one that if you're in Illinois, I would recommend this one as well. Somewhat of a newer resource that's out there um, is the Native Trees of the Midwest, and this is by Sally Weeks out of Indiana. Uh, this is just a fantastic book. It's a thicker, bigger book, so this is not gonna be necessarily a field manual, um, but it's something to keep um, you know, in your office or in your house or in your car and then refer back to. It has really good maps, really good information and great pictures for the trees of the Midwest. I use this book a whole lot. Um, it's a great resource to have, so it's a good one. And then more recently, we do have uh, a lot of uh, people using apps, smartphone apps to help identify plants. And so there's a bunch out there you know, there's iNaturalist and Seek and PlantNet, and there's some that are specific to trees. And they work fairly well when you're looking at growing season trees, when you can take pictures of leaves and things like that. What I found in general with these smartphone apps, and I've tested them out in the, um, working on this, this ID course here, was they don't work as well in the winter. Um, they don't, they're not calibrated as much to these winter identification characteristics that we use. And so I don't think they're as accurate. And I, so they have less applicability for trying in the winter. I did a little test and I took a picture of some bark or a full tree just to see. And you can see here um, that the app said that they're not confident enough to make a recommendation but they had the top 10 suggestions and none of those suggestions were actually what this tree was. Um, so I'd switched from that and then tried to go to just a twig thinking that that may be better. And again, it said, we're not confident enough to make the recommendation, but this tr tree, which was Kentucky coffee tree was in its top 10 suggestions. And so I don't think it's, it can be somewhat useful, I guess, to help verify but overall, I don't think it's accurate enough and you can get the characteristics um, um, seen enough and, and identified by the, the smartphone apps to be very applicable for winter identification. So while they're good in the summer, they're good for a lot of things. Um, I don't think you can easily um, get away with just using smartphone apps as your way of identifying these trees in the winter. You're gonna have to use those resources that we had, the print resources and, and go out like that. All righty, jumping into our winter tree terminology. Um, again, these are, the, these are the characteristics that we look at when we're identifying trees in the winter. So I'm gonna go over them slowly. I'm gonna hit uh, a bunch of the, the characteristics and hopefully have pictures and show what we're talking about. And we're gonna start with the twigs what's in the twigs and what we look at when we, when we want to identify a tree um, and we can get our hands on the, the twigs of the tree. So the first characteristic uh, that we want to talk about is the terminal bud. And so the terminal bud is at the end of the twig. The terminal bud is usually covered in scales of some type, although that's not always the case. And that really is um, the bud, that's the growing point for next year's new twig. So the terminal bud usually will open up and then you'll get a new twig coming out of that. 
um, the following year. So in general, terminal buds are larger than um, the other buds on the twigs. And so we use those for identification quite a bit because they're larger, you can see them, and sometimes they look quite a bit different than the other buds. The other buds that are along the sides of the twig, we call those lateral buds. So lateral buds are typically um, leaves, next year's leaves. They can be flowers, um, and they can even be side shoots growing as well. Um, but those are also very important. They let us figure out, um, they sometimes look different than the terminal buds. They are a different type of bud sometimes. They also let us figure out the arrangement, whether it's opposite or alternate, um, but lateral buds. So we use those as well. Now buds in general, like we said, are often covered in scales, um, but you wanna look at the characteristic of those buds. So when you're trying to identify a tree, you wanna get the overall size of the buds, the shapes of the buds, are they um, blunt, are they pointed, are they swollen and larger than the twig, are they smaller than the twig? And then you can also look at kind of some of the different types of buds and, and especially the types of scales that are over the buds. Some are cone or cap-like, like the top left there, where it's really just one scale that covers over the entire bud. Some have overlapping scales, kind of like shingles. So on the top right, we call those imbricate buds. So you'll have multiple scales, three, four, sometimes many, many more than that and they overlap each other, again, kind of like shingles. That's probably the most common type of bud you'll find. Um, a lot of trees will have that. And so that's imbricate buds. And then we have valvate buds. And valvate buds typically have scales, but they don't overlap themselves like uh, a shingle, like shingles, like the imbricate bud. A lot of times they may meet up and pair against each other. So that would be two scales that meet against each other but don't overlap, like the bottom right. So we call those paired valvate. And we have other valvate buds that may have three or four um, scales on it that cover the bud, but they don't overlap themselves. They don't pair up necessarily. And so sometimes people call those naked buds. And so the picture in the center would be a valvate bud um, that doesn't overlap and, does, and is not paired. And then you'll hear the terminology out there, a lot of scaleless or a naked bud as well, and that you really don't see any true scales in them at all. Again, these are all different characteristics that you'll see on buds. And if we see when we talk about them and identify them, these are the things you're looking at. When you look at a bud, pay attention to it. What kind of the scales does it have? How big is it? What shape is it? And then that'll start getting you um, closer and closer to identifying that tree you're wanting to look at. And it's also important to realize that buds can be different um, on even the same tree. So these are two pictures taken the same day of red maples. Uh, the one on the left is a red maple from a non-flower producing twig. And you can see the buds on there are a little pointed and small. The twig itself is kind of reddish in color. On the right, um, you can see the, the buds are swollen, they're rounded, they're bigger that's a flower producing twig. So most of those buds that you see there are flower buds. They're a little larger, they're getting ready to produce the flowers for red maple. Red maple is interesting in, in that it's one of our first trees, first plants in general to bloom in the spring. Here in Southern Illinois, it's usually blooming um, around now when you'll start blooming within the next couple weeks. And so in, even in the winter, you'll have these swollen buds um, that get bigger and bigger until they finally open up and produce their flowers. And so they look very different, right? The one on the left looks very different from the one on the right. So just realize when you're identifying and you're looking at, at twigs and you're looking at a tree, don't just go from one twig or one characteristic. Look around and see kind of what's average, see what's out there and see if anything differs that can kind of help clue you in on, on what you're looking at and what the characteristics are. And they may differ um, from a young tree to an old tree. It may differ from a flower producing twig to a non-flower producing twig. There's a lot of variation and you have to kind of get used to that. Um, moving on, um, so some more uh, terminology here. 
So if you see the arrow pointing here to this picture, um, it's an encircled scar. And so there's a scar all the way around the twig. We call that the bud scale scar. So that's the location of where last year's terminal bud was. So that's the initiation of this year's growth. Sometimes you can use those and count back and see how old a, tw a twig is. Um, but those bud scale scars are usually encircled the entire twig and are pretty prominent at times. And so sometimes having those or the conditions of those will help you identify a tree as well. The little dots that are on twigs and many, many uh, twigs have this, not all of them, those are lenticels. And so sometimes the color of the lenticels, the amount of them, whether they're raised or not, um, can help you identify a tree as well. And so these lenticels actually have some purpose when it comes to the twigs. They're, they are used in some oxygen exchange or gas exchange um, through respiration and, and movement of the twig that way. So they do have a purpose um, for identification. Again, you can have some twigs that'll have very large noticeable lenticels and some twigs have no lenticels whatsoever and anywhere in between. But we do use those, you'll see that. And some, some trees, it's very noticeable. This is just an example. So this is black cherry, one of our very common trees here across all of Illinois. And the lenticels kind of change in, in looks and change in condition and characteristics as the twigs age. You can see on the left, all the little tiny dots, the little lenticels are tiny dots on the left on the very small twigs. As they, uh, the twigs enlarge or get bigger, um, those dots get a little larger. You can see in the, the picture that's second from the left, they're starting to get a little bit of a horizontal look to them, uh, but still plenty of lenticels. The next picture to the right, um, the, the twigs are a little bit larger. You see the lenticels are larger and they are um, starting to get even more elongated. And then the next one, when we get a two or three inch stem, you can still see those lenticels on here, but now they're becoming definite lines all across the bark. And so depending on the size of the twig you're looking at, um, they could be little tiny dots or lines, horizontal lines. It changes over time with size as well. Uh, moving along. So leaf scars, this is another very important um, characteristic that we use when we're identifying trees. So a leaf scar is where this uh, leaf was attached previously to the twig. Um, and then the, when the leaf falls off, it leaves a little place there, it's a scar. And these will be, will vary very much in size, in shape. Some are raised with, you know, on nodes, some are kind of sunken. Um, and so we use that a lot, the size of the leaf scar, the shape of the leaf scar um, when identifying twigs and identifying trees. Now, if you look inside of that leaf scar, you'll see um, these little dots in there. And so these are called bundle scars. And so when a leaf is attached to a tree, um, it is connected throughout its system, its vascular system, running water and nutrients um, and energy up and down through the tree. And so basically that piping is connected inside of the leaf scar and we call those bundle scars. Now they vary a lot depending on the species. Sometimes they're clusters of small dots, sometimes they're large, um, but we use those a lot when identifying trees and are basically what the bundle scars look like within the leaf scars. And they vary a lot. You can see on the top left there, that's a green ash. You can see the bundle scars. There's many small bundle scars that are shaped like a U. A U. Um, bottom left is another red maple and it has three distinctive little dots with a um, triangular leaf scar. In the middle is coffee tree, very large bundle scars that are kind of dispersed throughout the, um, the leaf scar. And then on the top right is black walnut and black walnut is one of the neatest, I think, looking leaf scars. It has those um, three lobes like that and uh, a little monkey face almost, right? You have three distinct regions where the bundle scars occur. So we use those a lot. Now moving on, um, one of the things we use the buds for 
is to figure out the arrangement. Now, normally if we're identifying trees in the summer, we would use the leaves. We would look at the leaves and see, are there two leaves at one time, so opposite, or is there just one and then, then another, then another, which is alternate. Um, we, can, we don't have the leaves in the winter, so we use the buds. What are, how are the buds arranged? Is there one bud at a time, two buds at a time? Is it opposite or alternate? That's very important um, because that's usually the very first characteristic that we use to identify, uh, to start kind of narrowing down um, trees, which tree it is. The first thing when I walk up to and look at a tree and I'm looking at the buds, I try to figure out, is that tree opposite or is that tree alternate? And so you want to look at those buds. You can see on the left here, there's one bud at a time, one bud, then it goes to the other side, one bud, then one bud. So that's an alternate. On the right here in this box elder twig, very clearly two buds at a time across from each other. That means it's opposite. Now, if you're trying to identify trees in, uh, in the winter and they're large trees, sometimes you can't get to the buds and see them. You can actually um, pick up this opposite or alternate patterns just by looking at the twigs or looking at the stems, looking up into the tree. So if you look up in the tree, um, pay attention and try to see are most of the twigs opposite or most of them are the branches opposite or most of them alternate. The one on the left here, you can see there's some that kind of look opposite, but by and large, you have one branch coming out at a time, one branch at a time, one branch at a time. So it tells us that that's probably an alternate tree. On the right here, you see that by and large, there's two branches at a time, two branches, two branches, two branches. So you can really see that branching pattern that shows that there's usually two branches branching out from one time. That helps you to identify that as an opposite tree, even when you can't see any of the buds. And that does bring up a good point in, tone, in terms of equipment that you like to use and what you wanna bring out with you. I really like bringing a set of binoculars with me when I'm trying to identify trees in the winter. Sometimes you can't reach the buds and see them, but if you get binoculars, you can get a look at them. You can more easily identify whether it's opposite or alternate. Having a good set of binoculars is a really good tool for identifying trees. So a little bit more on this leaf or bud uh, branch arrangement. Again, this is the first question that I look for. This is the first thing I look for when I'm identifying trees. Is, is it opposite? Is it alternate? If it is opposite, there is a smaller number of trees that kind of fall within that, um, that group. So in Illinois, our oppositely arranged trees, they have opposite leaves or opposite buds, in general are our ashes, our maples, most of our dogwoods. We do have an alternate leaf dogwood, which throws people. Uh, buckeyes or horse chestnut, our viburnums, our elderberries, and then a few little others. Um, but by and large, what you're going to find, if it's opposite, it's going to fall into that group right there. Now, if it's alternate, you have a lot of other options. Hickories, walnuts, oaks, elms, cherries, uh, sycamores, so forth and so on. There's a lot of our trees that are alternate. So it's always nice when you're walking up and trying to identify these trees and you find one that's opposite because you know you have a smaller list to choose from than if it's alternate. But again, first thing you're looking for. Now there is another category uh, that's a little weird, which is our world ones. And so a world leaf arrangement is one that's gonna have three or more buds, leaf scars or leaves coming out from the same time. Um, they don't always have this. And so the one that we have in Illinois that's a full size tree is catalpa. Um, there is button bush, which is a native shrub, but it's never going to get to that tree size. And so if you find one that has very clearly and consistently three buds or three leaf scars or three leaves in the summer coming out from the same point on the branch, and it happens again and again on that, you're probably looking at a catalpa, um, especially if it's in the wild. So that's world. Now, the, the confusing thing is sometimes catalpa has only opposite. Uh, so not every branch is whirled, not every intersection has three, um, three buds on it. 
but by and large, most of them do. So that's why you want to look at multiple ones. If you find a world leaf arrangement, uh, bud arrangement, you're, uh, you're doing good for sure. All righty. So I think it's time for a quick knowledge check-in. Uh, I'm trying to use the polls on here. And so here's the first one is knowledge check-in. Name this feature. What is this feature on this twig? And so what I'm going to do is start a poll so you all can take a look at that feature and then vote. Is it a terminal bud? Is it a lenticel, a bud scale scar, or a leaf scar? So I'll give you uh, 30 seconds, a minute or so to answer in here. And then I will announce the, the answer. All right, I see a lot of people voting. That's wonderful. All right, I'll give you all about 10 more seconds to answer in. All righty, so I'm going to go ahead and end the polling. And I will share the results. And as you all see, uh, leaf scar. Sure, that's the leaf scar right there. And almost everybody got it right. Um, there is. Uh, that one's a little tricky because the, the lines around it do look like bud scale scars, but the circle was right around the leaf scar on this. Um, this happens to be a tulip tree. All righty. Next quick uh, knowledge check in. This little twig right here, you can't really see the buds. You can kind of see them, but I wanted to know, is this opposite or alternate. Alrighty, people are answering right away. I'm glad to see that. So I will let you all give you about 15 more seconds to go ahead and answer. I tried to choose a picture that was somewhat tricky that you couldn't clearly see it just um, just for fun. All righty, it looks like most everybody has answered. And I'm sharing it. This is opposite. So this is actually a flowering dogwood twig. So great job, everybody. With this one, um, you see there's one little bud right there, one bud right there, and then here's one bud and one bud right here. This one was a little bit tricky because you couldn't see it as clearly. All right, great job. So just moving on, um, again, when you're looking at twigs, when you're identifying trees, um, there's a lot of variation in these twigs by species. And so not only do we wanna look at the buds and the bud arrangement, are they opposite or alternate, how large are the buds, um, pay attention to the overall shape of the, of the twig. Is it straight, is it curved, is it thin or thick? There's a ton of variation out there. And so in this group here, um, all the way on the left are some of the very thin twigs. So things like hackberry, black cherry, elms, sugar maples typically have very, very thin twigs. And then it works its way up farther and thicker and thicker. And on the right side, we have things like coffee tree and buckeye, which has very, very stout, bigger than a pencil um, twigs. And there is some variation even in an individual plant that you'll find. But overall, twig, side, twig size is a good characteristic to kind of go on thin twigs, thick twigs. So our thin twig species, um, so these are the ones that have very, very thin, wispy twigs. Um, those are things like beeches, birch, or cherries, or plums, 
are elms or hackberries, ironwood, musclewood, serviceberry, willow. In general, those groups have our thinnest twigs. Moving up to moderately thin twigs, these are still fairly thin, but they're not um, like crazy thin. So those would be dogwoods, honey locust, our maples, our pawpaw, persimmons, uh, red buds. Some of our oaks, pin oaks and willow oaks particularly have very thin twigs. Uh, sycamore and yellow poplar are, are moderately thin twigs. Now moderately thick twigs or moderately stout you would call it. Um, so these are fairly big but not obviously huge. Um, so ashes, black gums, um, cottonwoods, you could call that moderately stout or even stout. Most of our hickories, most of our oaks, sweet gums and walnuts kind of fall into this category. And there is a few trees that have very stout twigs. And so that would be their buckeyes, our catalpas, uh, coffee tree, some of our hickories, particularly shagbark, shellbark, and then mocker nut, which is the biggest um, twig of all the hickories. Uh, burr and swamp white oaks for sure, sumacs, and I put tree of heaven in there, even though tree of heaven is not a native tree, but it has a hugely uh, thick stout twig, so I had to throw it in there. Other characteristics you want to look for, um, are there hairs on the buds, are there hairs on the twigs, or are they smooth, is there a, a waxy covering on it? Those are things that you want to look for. Those are characteristics that may be um, unique to that species or help you identify that species. So figuring out kind of how hairy is it? Is it hairy or not? Is it smooth, waxy? Always good things to pay attention to when you're looking at twigs. There are some uh, kind of clues or characteristics that'll help you right away. One good example are oaks. So within the Quercus genus are oaks they tend to have a lot of buds clustered towards the tip of the twigs. You can see here there's a central uh, terminal bud, but it's surrounded by a bunch of lateral buds. See right here and the central terminal bud surrounded by a bunch of lateral buds. That's fairly consistent across um, all the different oak species. So if you see that and it's consistent, you see a lot of buds clustered towards the tip of the twig, it's a good indication that it might be an oak. Um, some other characteristics are the pith. So the pith is the center of a twig um, or, a, or a small stem and it varies a lot depending on the species. Um, sometimes they're very substantial piths, sometimes they're tiny. Um, in cross section like this, uh, for example, oaks will tend to have a, a pith that almost looks like a star shape. Um, that some can be hard there's a lot of different things out there. Some can be spongy. So this is not one I always look for, but sometimes it's important when it comes to identifying individual species. You can have pits that are solid, some that are hollow, some that are soft, really spongy. And then a few cases where you have a chambered pith, where you can see there, you cut it open or slice it open, you'll have all these little um, individual chambers in there. So when it's cut in, in section, like cross section like that, it almost looks like a ladder. Another good tip when you're out identifying trees then is to bring a pocket knife with you. Um, that'll help you to cut off branches, uh, to slice them so you can look at the pith. It's always a good thing to do. So I'm going to move from this to, these are kind of all the, the twig characteristics. I'm going to jump into the other major characteristics that we look at when we're identifying trees in winter would be the bark characteristics. So those are very important. And there's a bunch of different um, ways of identifying or ter term terminologies we use for bark. And so one of the most common kind of bark styles we have is called ridge and furrowed bark. And so these are ones where we have usually somewhat thick bark but there's um, identifiable kind of ridges or high points in the bark that usually run up and down vertically and they're um, in between kind of deep furrows in the, in the bark. And so um, we tend to call that ridge and furrow. They may be shallow, they may be thick, but that's a common uh, 
a characteristic, a common type of bark that you would identify. Many, many of our trees kind of fall into this ridge and furrow kind of style bark. Some of the ridge, ridge and furrow bark sometimes may interlace amongst themselves. And so you'll have a, a noticeable diamond pattern. And so that way it's not just a longitudinal ridge that runs and then there's a clear furrow beside of it, but they kind of intersect with each other, interlace to this, this diamond pattern. This is really common in our ash trees, uh, our walnuts and hickory trees. You'll see this very clear diamond pattern. There's other species as well, um, but just keep in mind, this is kind of a subset of those ridge and furrow. Another group are peeling or flaky bark. And so these would have very, very thin bark that tends to flake or peel. It's soft or it breaks easily. Uh, it peels away from the, the tree. So we have some sycamore there, river birch, even ironwood, which is small, thin little peels, but you get up there, they definitely are peeling or flaking. So a common characteristic, and this differs from the next one, which is platy. So platy is similar to peeling where it has these big pieces that'll peel or curl back, but it's going to be hard. The bark is hard um, on there. And it's not soft or thin. Um, so platy bark is usually ones that are gonna peel from the side and kind of peel out from the side. Uh, sugar maples, when they're larger, white oaks are two great examples of, of trees with platy bark. And that differs a little bit from shaggy bark. So platy bark will tend to peel from the side. So if it's going up and down, the sides of that uh, bark will peel out and curl back. Shaggy bark tends to have uh, the tops and the bottoms loose and they'll peel or curl away that way. So it does look a, a bit different. Um, the classic ones on this are shag bark hickory and shell bark hickory as our, our, our classic examples of shaggy bark. but there's definitely others. Another one would be our smooth or tight bark. And so this is uh, a group of trees that have smooth bark really are, um, again, very, very smooth. There's not any definable or recognizable ridges or furrows or pattern. A lot of times it's overall, the bark is just going to be kind of a consistent, smooth, or maybe lightly patterned bark on this. We often call that tight bark or thin barked as well. And then there's a lot of other trees that have thicker bark, um, but it's not in a recognizable ridge and furrow pattern. And so they're smaller groups. We tend to call this blocky. And so the classic example of a blocky bark on, is on the left is a flowering dogwood where it has these octagonal or rounded little blocks that are recognizable. It's not in any kind of ridge or pattern. Uh, the one on the right is persimmon, which also has these kind of bigger chunks in these blocks on it. And it can be somewhat tricky with all of these because sometimes, um, you know, a tree maybe you can maybe describe it as blocky. You can maybe describe describe it as ridge and furrow. And then some trees will have multiple kind of types of bark even on the same tree and the the champion of that would be our sycamores. And so you can see all of these types of bark here can be found on the same individual tree. Um, so it's hard to describe it. So you can have all the way from kind of lower blocky into peeling and flaky all the way to tight and smooth on the same individual. So pay attention like that, see what it's going on and see, um, you know, see what the bark is and kind of how to, uh, how you think you would describe it. Again, if you're looking at trees, especially bigger trees where you can't see the buds, we use the bark um, a lot on identifying these trees. So those are the major ones. I'm going to hit a little bit um, very briefly on form. So some trees will grow in kind of recognizable patterns or recognizable forms. And sometimes that's a good way of identifying trees. Sometimes we call these the 60 mile an hour trees. As you're driving by down the interstate, you can look over and identify a tree just by the way it's growing. And so that can be useful, not always on every tree, but when we go over the trees on Wednesday and Friday, we're gonna talk about their forms. And two good examples here would be a pin oak on the left and an American elm on the right. If you can see, and I've highlighted them with lines there, kind of how the branch and branches are going on these trees. 
So a, a pin oak is really a pyramidal shaped tree where at the top you have very, very narrow crown. And as you get to the bottom, the branches actually start to bend down towards the ground. And you can see that with this, really recognizable. So that's a, a unique form that helps you identify pin oaks. And then with American elm here on the right, you can see that the branches on American elm are strongly ascending or going up um, and often at narrow angles, right? So there's a kind of acute narrow angles and it gives the, uh, an elm tree, even from a distance, a very noticeable vase shape, a V shape to it that you can stand out. So that's what we're talking about when we talk about form. Um, we can also talk about canopy when we're talking about the form. Many of our oaks, especially like a post oak like this, have often very rounded canopies, broad rounded canopies or short trunks, and that helps you identify it as, as a form as well. So pay attention to that, especially on larger trees, it can come in helpful um, when you're identifying. So we're gonna do our last quick uh, knowledge check. So I have a picture here of uh, a tree. I won't tell you what kind of tree just yet, but I want you to describe the bark and I'll put up another poll for that. And so which of these terms do you think would best describe this bark? And this one I intentionally chose because I thought it was a little bit more difficult. You could fit into, this doesn't necessarily cleanly fit into one category, but I think that's a great example of, um, of how the real world, when you're trying to identify these, it's not always as simple it, there. It's not always clean cut. All right, I'll give you all about 15 more seconds or so. Um, and again, if you, if you don't agree with my answer at the end, that's fine. Um, like I said, there's a lot of variation and it's a little tricky sometimes. Alrighty, another five seconds. Great. So the, um, the answer uh, predictably was way all over the board, right? We had a lot of people that thought it was blocky, a lot of people thought it was ridge and furrowed, and a lot of people thought it was platy. I'm glad to see nobody thought it was tight or smooth bark. Um, to me, so this is a this is a sassafras, and to me, I called this one ridge and furrowed. I could see where you could call it blocky as well, because there's definitely some, some blocks. I would steer away from platy because platy usually has it's more peeling away, but I could certainly see why you would call that. But I called it ridge and furrow. So if you can see my cursor, there's some of these long ridges that make its way up and down. But I think you could call it uh, blocky and be completely within um, okay calling it blocky as well. Last one. Which group of trees are known for having their buds clustered towards the tip of the twig? And I will put the last poll up for that one. And a lot of people are answering. I'm happy to see that. Now, of course, this doesn't mean that um, this group of trees are the only group of trees that, that could have their buds clustered towards the tip of the twig, but it's just a general characteristic that tends to fall, um, commonly occur within this group. A lot of people are answering. I'll give you all about 10 more seconds. Alrighty, it looks like the answering is slowing down. So I'm gonna go ahead and end the poll. And it looks like almost everybody got it. Uh, oaks, right. Oaks are as a group tend to have their, their um, buds clustered towards the tip of the twig. So fantastic. Alrighty, a few more things to highlight here before we get into the keys. One of the things are unique features. And so some trees will have a feature that's so unusual or unique, it really helps you identify that tree easily. Um, 
I put in here bald cypress with a strongly buttressed uh, base, mostly as an excuse to put pictures of my kids in my PowerPoints. I love doing that. Um, and believe it or not, this is in Illinois. So if you are not from Southern Illinois, uh, you are missing out on some wonderful trees down here, including thousand year old cypress trees that are uh, absolutely amazing. So that's my plug for visiting Southern Illinois. Um, but the buttress of a, of a bald cypress is a great example of a unique feature. Some of the more common trees that we see would have these and we'll mention them when we get into individual trees. But the, the woody branch thorns of a honey locust are a great example of a unique feature that makes identification of that species easy. Um, hackberries tend to have the layered hard warts across the bark that really helps as well. So again, um, look for those features. Something that stands out with that tree could help you identify it. A couple more little examples of unique features. One would be sassafras twigs tend to curve upward towards the tip. Um, it's really noticeable when you see that. It's kind of part of its form, but it stands out. Other examples would be the spines uh, on Devil's Walking Stick or the, um, the remnants of the old fruit that often stay throughout the winter on yellow poplar. One unfortunate unique feature that is seen now across Illinois, and it actually helps you identify ash trees, would be blonding due to emerald ash borer. And so emerald ash borer, if you don't know, is a bug that's attacking our ash trees, but it, the trees that are impacted by that tend to have this blonding feature where a lot of their bark is sloughing off that can actually help you identify them from a distance and, and easily. Some trees have uh, what's called marcescent leaves, which means that they hang onto their leaves even after the leaves have died um, for the winter and senesced and um, they'll hold on to them. So beeches are classic for that. Shingle oaks, sugar maples will do that as well. A lot of other species that can be helpful for you. If you're identifying a tree, there's nothing in the winter, there's nothing wrong for going up, unfurling some of these tree uh, these leaves that are hanging on the tree to kind of help you figure out um, what that tree is. That's a completely valid thing and so I do that from time to time so take advantage of these leaves that are hanging on trees um, as a way of helping to identify. Similarly but something you have to be a little careful about is looking down when you're under a tree and trying to identify it. Um, seeing what leaves are on the ground below a tree can kind of help you identify sometimes what that tree is. You have to be careful because other leaves, of course, can float in from nearby trees and it can mix you up. But it's a good way that if you are trying to, trying to figure out this tree and you've got it down to one or two species and you look down and all the leaves are from one of those species, that's a good trick to kind of help uh, on this, um, this winter identification. It's something that I do is just another double check. So definitely, um, Look, look at your feet, look at the leaves at, at the ground that can maybe help you out for sure. Other things is some of our trees retain their fruit well into winter. And so the fruit is something else that can be um, useful in identifying it. Some are very, very recognizable like the bladders on bladder nut, um, but others like box elder often hold on to their Samara um, well through winter. It can help you identify them as well. So look for those characteristics. Look for that. It's just a clue. And similar to the leaves, you can look down at the ground and try to find fruit. That may help out as well um, when you're looking to identify things. Again, just as another check for you. So it's another tool that you can use. And the last characteristic we're going to talk about today is habitat, where trees grow. There's certain trees that'll grow really in, in very defined areas and that helps you figure them out. And there's other trees that have very broad habitat characteristics or habitat suitabilities. And so you can't really use them to identify them because they grow everywhere. But in general, some of our bottomland or riparian trees, so these are ones that are growing in uh, area floodplains or next to streams, things like box elders, cottonwoods, pecans, red mulberries, river birch, sweet gum, sycamores, willows, silver maples. Those are ones you would expect in those uh, floodplains or along waterways where you would find those. This next group I kind of titled music trees. And so they are in our, our 
standard forest, not our low super wet forest, but not our really dry forest. And this is a big group. Probably the majority of our trees fall into this group. Uh, the majority of our forest falls into this type of forest. But with it, you're looking at basswood, beech, walnuts, a lot of our oaks, uh, particularly white oaks, and northern red oaks, sugar maples. Uh, a lot of our hickories fall into this um, for sure. So that's a big group of trees. There are some drier upland trees. So these are sites that may be south facing slopes, shallow soils um, on the tops of ridges. Things like black oaks, pignut hickories, red hickories, scarlet oaks, winged elms potentially um, kind of grow in these drier sites for sure. So kind of paying attention to what uh, what site you're in, what are the characteristics of the site, what kind of habitat will help you narrow down sometimes. Like you're probably not going to find a black jack oak in a bottomland floodplain example. Uh, there is a there are a bunch of trees that have very wide habitat tolerances that you really can't necessarily nail down just on habitat. So they'll grow in many, many places, American elms, bitternut hickories, black gums, green ash, so forth and so on. Um, so it works well for some and other other trees. Um, they're just they're too much of a generalist. There are a group of trees that um, I've identified here um, when I it, starting on Wednesday when we talk about them, you'll see me use it over and over again, which I call a fence row tree. And so sassafras is a great example, persimmon's another one, um, that they love um, fence rows. So you'll see them growing up in old fence rows very commonly. And so when I, when I come across or talk about one of those species, I'll mention it. There's another group of species that really love old fields. They typically are wind dispersed seeds and they'll move in. That's the first species uh, when a, a field becomes abandoned. So that would be things like American elm and box elder and green ash. They love moving into you know, new fields. So those are the characteristics. I'm going to end very quickly on using keys for identification. And so a lot of these resources I shared at the beginning have dichotomous keys. And so that really is the roadmap for identifying an unknown species. And these keys are basically nothing more than a series of this or that questions. So you look at uh, a tree, a twig, a, an unidentified species, and if it's done right, um, the question should be, it's either this or it's that, and it should cleanly fall into one of those groups in the ideal situation. And you go to that next question, and, and it basically you move from question to question, and every time you answer a question, it's eliminating more and more of those options until you get down to, you've got one single choice and you know what it is. And in winter tree ID, the characteristics that we talked about today, the twigs, the buds, the arrangement, leaf scars, so forth and so on, those are the characteristics that are asked in those questions um, in the keys that'll guide us to um, the, the correct identification. I like using keys if you don't know a species, obviously, but even if you do and you know species, it's a wonderful idea to walk through these keys from time to time, bring one of these books out with you. It not only lets you get used to the questions that are asked in keys, so when you do come across an unknown species, you're able, better able to identify it, but it also helps you um, know those species better. You pick up on the characteristics that that species um, is, is used to identify that species. It just helps you out. So I like going through keys, even with species that I know and so, for example, here's a, a quick key that I clipped out the, the relevant parts to this, um, this twig. And we would be able to identify this fairly easily just based on this. Now, we cut it open and look at the twig. We see that the pith looks like this. That's a good characteristic to use as well. And so, with this, um, you can go through this fairly easily, right? And so let's go back to this. And so we start at question one and the question one is, is, are there leaf scars absent or present? We can see a big leaf scar really obviously on this one. So it'd be present. We go down to the next one. Is it, uh, is, are the world or opposite and alternate? This one to me is clearly alternate. So we go down then to three to alternate. Are there thorns? We can't really see that here, but I'm saying there's not thorns on this one. And it gets down to, and the next question would be, 
are, is the pith chambered? We already saw that the pith was chambered. And so the next question would be, are the leaf scars three lobed with three groups of bundle scars? We saw that very clearly here with one, two, three lobes and three bundle scars. And then we want to know is the pith pale brown or chocolate brown and it's pale brown. So that really quickly, those questions gets us within a matter of six or seven questions or less to figure out that this is a black walnut. And that's kind of, that's an easy option there, an easy example, but that's kind of how keys work. It asks you basic questions, you answer that one question, and then you go to the next question. Um, very, very useful and uses the things that we talked about today. So ending it all together, um, really what tree identification to me in the winter is, it's a puzzle and it's a process of elimination. The worst thing you can do is as you're walking up to a tree, already decide and come up to a conclusion as what it is. If you do that right away, you tend to get locked into what you think it is and you don't pay the attention, the attention to the characteristics you need and what they're telling you. So don't guess, don't rush to a conclusion, walk up to a tree, look at all the clues first, figure out is it opposite or alternate, describe those buds, describe the bark, get all of that in your head at one time before you take that next step to try to identify that unknown one. If it is truly unknown, use those keys for, for sure. For sure. Um, but it is a, it's a process of elimination. It's a slow process, but it's a process of using the characteristics to tell you what it, it, it is. Eventually, as you do that and you get more and more familiar with these trees, it becomes as easy as recognizing these trees as old friends. You can see them and you know what they are right away. It doesn't start out that way and you need to go slow and focus on the characteristics at first, particularly with new species or species you're not that familiar with. So what we're gonna do, um, to, well, today we focused on the basics. We really hit these characteristics in detail. What we're gonna do on Wednesday is really a species by species coverage for 20 common trees in Illinois. We're gonna hit the characteristics of those that we talked about today for those individual species. We're gonna compare closely related species and look alike so you can tell them apart, but we're gonna focus on what I think are common trees. Friday, we're gonna really spend most of the time on our oaks and hickories, which are often the difficult groups for people to identify, especially in the winter. We're gonna go into some very detailed comparisons of close lookalikes in those groups. And then we're gonna hit a handful of other species that are less common that I couldn't really fit in on Wednesday's class.